we discussed, reaching across the aisle without getting a backache <laughs> uh, to try to develop a bipartisan consensus for demilitarization. And tonight we're very proud to have with us, uh, well, on video will be Kelly Vlahos, who is the editorial director for the Quincy Institute's publication, Responsible Statecraft, and Mark Perry, who's a senior analyst at the Quincy Institute. Before we do that, though, we're gonna take a moment to update the events that are happening around the world. And honey, why don't you start? Sure, uh, thank you so much, Marcy, and good evening, everyone. My name is Hani Jodad Barnes, with some delegates and allies, and I co-host the Code Pin Calls with Marcy Winograd and Medea Benjamin, uh, gladly every uh, Tuesday evening. Uh, yeah, I'd like to give some updates on what uh, Secretary Blinken has been up to in terms of Guantanamo Bay. Um, so Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken said on Monday uh, that the Biden administration is actively looking into uh, recreating the position of the State Department envoy for the closure of the prison at the Guantanamo Bay naval base in Cuba. Uh, you may recall this was one of the demands we sent during our previous Code Pink Congress Capitol Hill calling and emailing party. Uh, so these calls do work uh, greatly, uh, I'm glad to say. Overall, about 800 detainees have been held at the US military prison, many tortured, uh, most never charged with a crime. Now about 40 remain and nine of those have been recommended for transfer to another uh, country. And I know Marcy that Code Pink has been leading on this effort for a long time, as well as uh, Muslim delegates and allies. We also put together a uh, petition on this uh, with Nadia Ahmed. So, uh, yes, yeah. Yes, thank you, uh, Hania, and thank you to Roots Action and Progressive Democrats of America. Uh, many of you are on this call for your leadership to close Guantanamo as well. Nothing can happen, I guess. You know, that's what we heard from the ACLU when we featured one of their. Uh, attorneys, nothing had happened to close Guantanamo until we have a, a special envoy overseeing the entire process for resettlement. So hopefully something concrete will happen on that, on that front. In terms of Palestine, Israel-Palestine, I just wanted to share two things. Some of you probably read that the parliament in Ireland voted unanimously to denounce Israel's annexation of Palestine. And this was significant in that Ireland was the first member of the European Union to do so. In Los Angeles, where I'm based part of the time, uh, United Teachers of Los Angeles, which represents 35,000 teachers, it's the second largest school district, they will be taking up a resolution to boycott in support of boycott, divestment, and sanctions in September. And in the run up to that, uh, it's, it's quite charged, quite heated with. Uh, you know, the Israel lobby is working overtime to complain to the school board, to complain to schools where teachers are talking about this, to try to essentially silence the debate and derail this resolution. It's a significant effort. Uh, it comes on the heels of San Francisco, the school district there, the teachers also voting to support BDS. And I know we have, I'm sorry, RJ Thompson, who's with Code Pink, uh, he's, he's one of our uh, experts, along with our co-founder, Jody Evans. And don't let me forget to say that we love you, Medea. We know she's in Peru representing all of us beautifully. She's there for the elections and it's a, it's a tight race and some disagreement uh, and charges of this and that, but uh, she's there fighting for us. Mm -hmm. So RJ is going to update us on, on China and what's happening with what just happened in the Senate and what will be happening in the house. So if we can, Unmute RJ, yeah. Yeah, all right. Uh, thank you, Marcy. So the US Innovation and Competition Act of 2021, uh, it started as some separate bills in the Senate, like the Endless Frontiers Act, the Strategic Competition Act, and the Meeting the China Challenge Act. And they were combined last month. Some of the worst aspects of the bill, uh, it undermines John Kerry's climate agreement with China. It uh, demonizes Chinese and Chinese American students with yellow peril and McCarthyism. It allocates $1.37 in military funding around China in the Indo-Pacific region, including $655 million for foreign military funding. It vests new unchecked emergency powers to the Secretary of Homeland Security, 
and it calls on schools and state legislatures to identify and remain vigilant to the risk posed by the undue influence of the Chinese Communist Party in the U.S. That is a quote from it. Uh, it passed the Senate, unfortunately, just today by a 68 to 32 vote. Um, and so now it will be going to the House. In the House, there is a companion bill proposed by Gregory Meeks, the Democrat uh, from New York's 5th District and chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, the bill is called the Eagle Act in the House. And in its introduction, Gregory Meeks acknowledged a need for cooperation with China on some issues like climate and COVID-19, but also said that China was the, the biggest threat to the US. So it is yet to be voted on in the House and it's a place where we could perhaps impact some change. Thank you. Thank you very much, RJ. Yeah, I, I, we don't have the roll call vote yet. So it'll be interesting to see who cast those no votes. A lot of problems with this bill that sailed through the Senate. It, it awards a lot of billions and upon billions of dollars for technology hubs that are basically uh, hubs of robotics and artificial intelligence, STEM programs, semiconductor uh, industry, but sandwiched in between all of that and this 1,445 page bill is as RJ mentioned, a lot of militarism uh, centering our foreign policy on the future of Taiwan. We'll see what happens in the House. I checked with uh, the Progressive Caucus Center to see if, if uh, they thought that the House would be voting on this bill or if they would vote separately at, you know, on Meeks's bill, which is called the Eagle Act. And we're not clear on that. So tonight when we host our calling party, we're gonna focus on two issues. One of which is Palestine and no money, no more money for the Israeli military, right? They want another billion dollars. They just received 700 or got the green light for 735 million in weapon sales, but also to uh, weigh in with our house members on this bill, the U US Innovation and Competition Act and say vote no. Until we hear further on what the future of that bill is, we want them to, to, to study it and vote no. Meeks's bill is 450 pages, not over 1400, but still. Um, there are a lot of problems with that bill. All right. Well, Marcy, um, thank you for the update. And thank you, RJ, for the update. Uh, really quickly, if you could all introduce yourselves in the chat, that would be wonderful. We do ask that you keep yourselves on mute um, and post your questions in the chat for our honorable speakers uh, until the very end where we would uh, unmute and say goodbye to our guests. So, Great, thank you. So uh, we came up, you know, we were talking about ideas for Code Pink Congress. And, and we thought, well, what about uh, reaching across the aisle, building a bipartisan consensus? And at this point, that might be a joke, but maybe not, right? There is precedent for this. Uh, we saw this at the end of the Vietnam War when Congress defunded that war. And then we saw it and, and even overrode Nixon's veto of that. And then we saw it again in 2019 with the War Powers Resolution to stop US complicity in the war on Yemen. Trump vetoed that and Congress did not override that veto. So what is the future? Is there a future for bipartisan consensus on demilitarization? We invited two uh, wonderful speakers, those who have been in the trenches with both Democrats and Republicans, libertarians, fighting this ever increasing militarization and increases in the Pentagon budget. So we're gonna start with Kelly Vlahos and we have her on video. And she is the editorial director for Responsible Statecraft, which is the publication of the Quincy Institute. And she has had a long history with the conservatives in this country. She was formerly the executive editor of the American Conservative Magazine and, brace yourselves, she spent 15 years as an online political reporter for Fox News in Washington, DC. She was also the Washington correspondent for Homeland Security Today Magazine, which I haven't read, but I get the picture. So at this point, we're going to cue it up to my interview with Kelly. She couldn't be with us tonight, it's her birthday. Uh, but she did do an interview with me earlier, and I asked her about the background of the Quincy Institute, how it came to be in 2019, uh, who's involved, and her thoughts on bipartisan demilitarization efforts. So, Mary, if you could cue that up, we'll take a look. Don't fit. You know, there is such a, uh, there's such enthusiasm out there for changing the way that we approach uh, our role in the world, the wars, you know, uh, the militarism, the military industrial complex, but yet the two parties aren't doing it for us. And um, 
you know, uh, there's nobody in Washington because all the, the think tanks are, are funded by either the left or the right. And so they got their they got their sticks. So it really was this idea that, oh, wow, we can find this common ground. And maybe if the both sides get together, we can really pack a punch. And so that's why it was real, really novel that you had George Soros on the left and the Charles Koch Institute on the right becoming the two major anchor funders for this. And, you know, people, you know, there were a lot of people who were naysaying it and, you know, because either they were on the right and they didn't want anything to do with George Soros or, or vice versa. But, you know, I feel like, you know, with the intellectual power that we have, so we have all that, you know, we have the, the impulse, you know, Trita Parsi, who's, you know, my boss, he's the a vice president of the programs. He's really the, he really started this thing. Um, he wanted us to be an action tank, you know, not just a think tank that sits around and writes papers and, you know, ponders uh, things. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's sort of like engaging in this sort of Washington, you know, ivory tower space, but to actually get out there and start mixing it up with the interventionists, with the neocons, you know, with the right wing, with um, the, the liberal inter, you know, interventionists, you know, the Hillary Clinton types too. And so marrying that impulse with, you know, really a number of scholars on regional issues like China and Middle East, Afghanistan, we have a grand strategy program or we have a Russia expert, you know, so they, we got the intellectual foundation for, for, for why we're arguing for the things we are you know, matched with a real advocacy so we can take that and then go on the Hill and talk directly to members of Congress and even the White House and say, you know, this is how we should be talking about this. This is how we can affect change. And look, this isn't just fly by night, you know, advice. You know, this is stuff that's really rooted in some serious scholarship and research. And then I'm running the, the magazine Responsible Statecraft, which is sort of like a it's an online magazine that takes outside contributors as well as staff and, and, and our fellows and in, in, in talking about restraint and talking about non-intervention and talking about how the military industrial complex is, is sort of like this self-licking ice cream cone that only benefits the defense industry and the politicians and has been screwing us for the last several decades and getting us into these wars and taking money, you know, from real domestic needs. So that is sort of our front facing. So, you know, put that all together. And we, I think we're making an impact because you got the blobby, you know, establishment people actually paying attention to what we have to say. They don't always agree, but then they're like, oh, because, you know, you got these smart people or saying things and they're real scholars with PhDs. And so they can't just be dismissed as cranks or whatever, you know, so we're kind of making impact. And like I said, we're actually affecting policy by having these relationships with members of Congress. Now, right now, it's kind of easy because you have the Democrats are in charge. You've got a Democrat in the White House. Um, so they're, they're a little more open. But, you know, I think we're making some strides on the Republican side, too. It might be a little more difficult, you know, in terms of like building a consensus, you know, on the right. But, you know, with that advocacy role, I think that that's that's actually having a an impact. So you, you see the impact, what, in the withdrawal from Afghanistan with the reversal yes. of the criminalization of those who cooperate with the ICC of extension of START. Yeah, I mean, for specifically the Afghanistan issue, we, we actually um, brought together a campaign with uh, both left and right uh, nonprofits and other think tanks and action tanks uh, a, a few months ago, I'd say about, well, I don't wanna say three or four months ago in earnest and basically saying, okay, we're gonna do stuff on Twitter. We're gonna do uh, op-eds. We're going to um, have letters and have them signed and delivered to the White House and to you know, specific targeted members of Congress. And we're going to do videos, and we're just going to we're just going to nail this issue. We had events, you know, panel discussions. We just did not let up, and it started with you know basically saying, "Hey, Trump did one thing right. He signed this Doha agreement. 
He wanted to get us out of Afghanistan. The, pe the Pentagon slow walked it, but now we have a deadline and it was May 1st. And so for, for months we were saying, get out by May 1st, get out. And everybody's like, oh, we can't get out on May 1st because it's precipitous withdrawal and logistics and the Taliban's going to take over. And we just, we just said, you know what, we're just going to get out in front and just say it because nothing's going to change with us staying for, you know, another six months, another year, another and 20 so, years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, you know, Biden came out and he said, you know, obviously we're not leaving by May 1st, but he said, I'm getting us out by September 11th. And we said, you know, okay, we'll take it. I mean, but we're going to, we're just, we're going to make sure you actually stick to it. And so, you know, so we're, we're, our latest campaign is we want to see all those interpreters and people that worked with them with with our troops there get out if they have to because a lot of them are in danger right now i mean we're not pollyannish we know what's going to happen the, 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 the taliban is already making gains on the floor there on the ground there um it's going to be a real hard road um but we are not convinced that staying is going to make it any better it's either going to prolong the inevitable or it will um, actually instigate more violence because we already made this agreement with the, with the Taliban and we'd be seen as breaking it. But the Afghan people, I, I believe in what I've read and with people who know much more than I do have said that Afghan people really do want to take control of their own country. Um, and it's just, we haven't been able to let them do that um, on, on so many levels. And so it has to happen, it has to be organic and yeah, it's going to be ugly. And I think that it's, as long as we continue to uh, work with the Afghans, keep the channels open, keep aid flowing if that's necessary, making sure that the aid actually gets to the right people and isn't corrupted um, and not just blow them off like we did the Iraqis. When we got out of Iraq, we left nothing there except for troops. And then even they were gone until ISIS took over and we had to go back in. But we didn't leave a real strong diplomatic presence there. Um, Kelly, two other issues before you leave us. Do you see any hope for changing Congress's support, uh, blanket support, unconditional support for Israel? And what about Yemen? You know, we had great hopes that Biden would enter office and he would immediately suspend those weapons shipments to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. We don't see that happening. And people are dying every day. Children are dying every day in Yemen. When is this going to end? It's very disappointing because the, the president seemed to come on really strong about getting out of Yemen and ending our support for uh, to Saudi Arabia for their offensive uh, um, operations. And that whole offensive operations has sort of been hanging there. Like, what does that even mean? And could, are there loopholes that we're not seeing? And have we actually ended that assistance? And uh, the more that the administration has been pressed on this, the less information we have. So we don't know what's going on there. Um, as you mentioned, we suspended the, the arms sales to the, the Saudis but it, they're, it, it's still pending. And as far as UAE, we are selling them all of that high tech weaponry, including F-35s and bombs and drones, even though they're still involved in Yemen, even though they say they aren't. And they're, they're responsible for all sorts of human rights violations in their own country. Um, in, in Libya, they're supporting, they're breaking an arms embargo there. I mean, it, 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 it's very disappointing. We've given more weapons to Israel, I mean, um, Egypt. And then the big question, of course, is Israel. I'm heartened because there was a movement by Democrats to cut off the aid, or at least, you know, there's some that want to cut it off. But after what happened in Gaza or while it was going on, they said, can we at least suspend the $735 million worth of, you know, precision guided missiles you're going to send them? And um, there was some hope there. Uh, unfortunately, I think the Biden administration is just letting that, th that those weapons flow in there. But the fact that people are rising up and feeling um, emboldened to question the $3.8 billion of aid that we give, the, the relative blank check that we give Israel with nothing in return, I mean, they've abandoned the two-state solution. They've abandoned the peace process. They've expanded the settlements. 
they've done everything to thwart peace, but yet we still keep giving them money and there's just no sense of any leverage. Um, and I think people questioning that for the first time is, was refreshing because as you know, it's been a third rail in, 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 in Washington politics to even speak ill of that relationship. And now they want another billion dollars for the Iron Dome. So right. that's another struggle. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us on Code Pink Congress. I'm Kelly honored. Is, is the editorial director for Responsible Statecraft at the Quincy Institute and a senior advisor as well, uh, working night and day to try <laughs> to change US foreign policy. Thanks. Yes. Again. Oh, thank you so much, Marcy. <laughs> All right, back we are. Uh, so that was Kelly, as, as you heard, the editorial director for Responsible Statecraft, which is an excellent publication. Check it out online. And now we have Mark Perry with us, and Hania is going to introduce Mark. Yeah, it's such an honor and a great pleasure, Marcy. When I was reading Mark's bio, I kept getting chills. So uh, <laughs> what an accomplished guest speaker. Um, Mark Perry is a senior analyst at the Quincy Institute. <clears throat> He is a widely published military and foreign affairs reporter and analyst. He is the author of 10 books, including The Pentagon's Wars, The Military's Undeclared War Against America's President, The Most Dangerous Men in America, The Making of Douglas MacArthur. The Boston Globe named uh, this book uh, on General MacArthur, the best nonfiction work of uh, 2014. Mark served as a senior foreign policy analyst and political director for uh, Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation, which founded the international campaign to ban landmines, which won the 1997 Nobel Peace Prize. It's a great honor to have you, Mark, and please take it away. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. I'm honored to be here. I'm a little bit um, intimidated by the numbers of people that this conference has attracted and impressed. Uh, you should be proud of the work you've done. And I agree with Kelly about, re about reaching across the aisle, though I know it's difficult. There is an emerging kind of libertarian Republican conservatism that is rearing its head. Now, uh, reaching across the aisle is always difficult with that political party, given its recent history, but I think we're gonna see more of this emerging libertarianism. And with that libertarianism comes cuts to the US budget and especially the defense budget. There are few and far between now, but there are going to be a lot more. But I wanna, I wanna take a little different tack than Kelly took um, about reaching across the aisle and talk about reaching across cultures. And to do this, I'm gonna tell you a story. Uh, back in the 1990s, I was a political director for Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation, which founded the international campaign to ban landmines. And it was a terrific um, initiative and very successful. Uh, we worked with Human Rights Watch, a number of other organizations. We signed up over 135 countries for a ban on landmines, but we didn't sign up the United States. So I got together with the leader of Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation. We decided that what we would do is reach across cultures, not the aisle, but reach across the culture, cultures in America and recruit military officers who would agree to a landmine ban. It seemed that we would never find any of them. We wrote a letter to the president that they would sign. And we sent out the letter to West Point graduates and senior military officers. This is April 1996, October 1996. And waited and waited and waited. And finally, I received a phone call from General Volney Warner, who said, um, you want to ban landmines? I said, yes, sir. He said, and uh, what does Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation do? I said, well, we run clinics that put legs on people overseas. He said, including Vietnam? I said, yes. He said. Anyone who wants to help the Vietnamese people, I'll help. So you can sign me up. And we got 14 senior military officers, Norman Schwarzkopf, Volney Warner, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, David Jones, signed this letter. We published it in the New York Times. 
and it changed everything. It worked. So my appeal here now is much the same. I think Code Pink, certainly the Quincy Institute, that's why they brought me aboard, can reach across cultures to appeal to the military on the defense budget. Now, it's kind of a default position of the US military that they'll always support increased defense spending. And everyone seems to think that's the way they think. But there are many military officers I know who are beginning to question the utility of more money that buys less defense, which is what's happening. And we all know it. And the particular focus of many officers now with the current Biden defense budget, which is a disappointment, but the focus of many military officers now is on nuclear weapons. I know Marcy has written about this for responsible statecraft, but I appeal to all of you to kind of back this effort. There's a, you know, there's a lot of low hanging fruit here. The F-35 doesn't work. We don't need another aircraft carrier. The army is too big. We're spending a lot on our overseas accounts for these useless losing wars. But the focus of many military officers I talk to has been on nuclear weapons because they are the most destabilizing part of our arsenal. I know many of you have done this before. You've talked to military officers, you've appealed to senior officers. But I think if we have a singular focus, if the progressive movement in this country can have a singular focus on the nuclear issue, we can make real progress. As I saw this, um, defense budget promoted by the Biden administration, I couldn't believe they basically kept the Trump nuclear upgrades the same. And I just, I just, something tells me, I just, I don't buy what they're trying to sell. And I'm not sure they're trying to sell it that hard. There are many members of Congress whom we know who are gonna focus on this nuclear weapons Upgrade, And I think the one low hanging fruit, it's almost on the ground that, that bears our attention is the upgrades to the ICBM. The upgrade is called the ground-based strategic deterrent. And it would replace the ICBM Minuteman three missiles by 2029. It's money wasted and it's dangerous and it's destabilizing. So in our work at the Quincy Institute, I've kind of urge people who are our coalition partners in the Pentagon Budget Coalition to focus on the nuclear weapons issue. We have lots of allies and we have military officers who are beginning to recruit who agree with us on the issue. And if you can get 15 or 16 U.S. Air Force senior officers retired, because nobody who's currently serving would ever step on a line, but if you can get 15 or 16 retired US Air Force officers who would agree with cutting the Minuteman III and oppose these upgrades and these billions of dollars of wasted money on nuclear weapons, including new, two new types of tactical nuclear weapons, I think we can make an incredible progress. I know that Elizabeth Warren in, um, in the Senate is extremely interested in this issue. Barbara Lee and Ro Khanna and Mark Pocan in the House are extremely interested in this issue. Listen, there's a lot of waste. I don't have to tell you all. There's a lot of waste in the Pentagon budget. But we're not going to kill the F-35. We're just not going to do it. And we're not going to kill two new aircraft here. It's not going to happen. And we're not going to kill, you know, we're not going to take 100,000 soldiers out of the Army and they could do with 100,000 fewer soldiers. That's not going to work. But we, with the help of our allies in the Congress in both parties, and with the help of the military, including US Air Force officers who don't believe in these systems and consider them dangerous, I think that this is something we can win if we will focus on it. So I'm happy to take your questions or your comments, and I hope that uh, my presentation has helped you. Thank you so much, Mark. Wonderful to have you with us tonight. Mark Perry, Senior Analyst with the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. I'll start off. Uh, so Mark, can you identify any Republican or independent, well, not Bernie Sanders, we know he, he, he would not be supportive of increased militarism, but can you identify any Republicans in Congress who you think would join us in a call to 
cut, reduce the military budget and nix the ICBM replacement, the, the ground-based strategic deterrent. And aside from identifying those in Congress, can you identify any constituencies that might be attracted to those Republicans who would join us? Uh, I can name um, I can name two or three variables and perhaps one Republican, but there will be more if one joins. Rand Paul has real doubts about uh, the ICBM. We're not going to get any member of Congress, Democrat or Republican, that's part of the um, the Missile Caucus, the ICBM Caucus. Uh, these, <coughs> excuse me, these land-based systems are in. North and South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, and the members of Congress and the Senate from those states uh, view this as a jobs creator. So they're not gonna join us. Uh, Southern Democrats and Southern Republicans are probably not gonna join us. But I think we could probably pick off members of uh, the California delegation, uh, Senate and, and members of the House. I think we can pick off New Englanders but we can pick off more if we have a retired Lieutenant General, and I have one in mind, I've been talking to him, who will stand up in the Congress and testify and give testimony that says, I'm an Air Force officer and I think these things are dangerous. And let's not forget, we have former Secretary of Defense, William Perry, who's been on this and has been crusading on this, and Daniel Ellsberg, but basically William Perry, who has real stature on this issue, who would join us. And he talks to Republicans every day. They know this is a destabilizing weapon. What they're worried about is the jobs that would create the, the money that they get from defense contractors. Let's not forget, defense contractors have one lobbyist per member of Congress. We have one advocacy director at Quincy. So we're out gun and we're out spent. But on this issue, on this issue as a matter of principle, I think we have a shot, especially if we can get an Air Force officer who will, who will walk in. If I walk into a senator's office, I, my name is Mark Perry, I'm a Quincy Institute, say, that's great. Uh, welcome to our discussion on national security. But if you have a, a Lieutenant General from the Air Force walk in and say, we can get rid of these weapons, they're dangerous, that makes a huge difference. Thank you. Hania, would you like to read a question? Yeah, I, I definitely would. Um, now, how do we transition economically from our uh, dependence on private military contractors and military spending in general? And what about the profit-seeking motives of the current existing military industrial system and the people who run this system? Decoupling our industrial base from military spending is the biggest obstacle we face. Uh, and I'll give you one example. Uh, Senator Sherrod Brown has voted for uh, money for the M1A1 Abrams tanks, 2,000 of which are sitting in the California desert unused because we don't need them. But year after year, he does this because there's 983 jobs out in Lima, Ohio, that are dependent on tank manufacturing. And it's a disappointment. This is Sherrod Brown. This isn't, you know, Jim Imhoff. This is Sherrod Brown. So decoupling, um, you know, the, the industrial base from, the, from military spending is our, it's the one thing that we have got to figure out how to do. Nobody's figured it out yet. Now, I've had discussions with people who thought long and hard about this and say, well, you do the Green New Deal. I just don't think that's going to work. The idea here isn't to substitute new spending with more spending on different things. I want to cut the defense budget. Um, and I, want to, I would like to get rid of these weapons, no matter what the cost. So I, I think, you know, some kind of industrial repurposing policy, which happened in the 90s, happened even in the midst of the Cold War during the Eisenhower administration. Um, this is, even at the Heritage Foundation, to be blunt with you, 
there's real questions about whether we really need 495,000 soldiers in our army. There are military officers who are raising money for K through 12 education because there's not enough money in our budget, but they won't cut the defense budget. So that decoupling is essential. I wish I had a simple answer on how to do it. When I come up with the answer, I'll give you all a call because this is, the, I think this is the hardest job we face. Thank you, Mark. I have a follow-up question. You, you said that you thought the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, uh, was the ground-based strategic deterrent. That's the replacement for the land-based intercontinental missiles. Right. So you mentioned, I think, an ad that you had placed uh, about landmines during the Vietnam. What do you think about, uh, do you think there's any point or that we would get mileage from Senator Warren, for example, holding Senate hearings on the destabilizing impact of the land-based missiles? I think she'd be happy to do it. And I, you know, I think the appeal to her is your first witness is Secretary of Defense William Perry. No relation, by the way. And your second witness is a retired Lieutenant General Air Force officer who I know. And and let's, you know, let's blow up the balloon here. Let's get this a lot of attention. She, you know, she was uh, when Kathleen Hicks, who's uh, Lloyd Austin's deputy was in her confirmation hearings, Elizabeth Warren asked her very specifically, now you're gonna review this nuclear posture review that the Trump administration brought out and you're gonna, and you're, you're going to subject it to real criticism. Do I have your word on that? Kathleen Hicks said, yes. Well, they didn't do that. They cut it a very fractional amount and they haven't reviewed it. Now, Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense says he's gonna review it. But you know, here we are, the first Biden budget would have been the perfect time to do it. Um, I think that Biden is protecting himself on the infrastructure bill, all kinds of political reasons. Uh, and I'm sure he's got very good excuses that he can rattle off about why he did this, keep the military off his back and all the rest of it. But at some point he's going to have to face the music with somebody like Elizabeth Warren because they gave a pledge to her that they would take a hard look at this and that they just would not swallow what Trump was selling. They haven't done that. They've swallowed it almost whole. Somebody posted in the chat, it was Obama that uh, began this quote, nuclear modernization or what I call rearmament program. And well, I read that uh, the reason he made that promise was because he wanted Republicans on board to extend the start treaty or to first start initially. Uh, but regardless, it was a, it was a Faustian, right. Faustian bargain. Yeah. And then Trump uh, awarded the $13 billion sole source contract to Northrop Grumman to develop the ground-based strategic deterrent. So back to the hearings for a minute. So you feel that hearings are effective? Well, I think they're effective in kind of um, <laughs> building support beyond the progressive left. Uh, you know, it's, you're not going to convince a guy like Jim Imhoff, uh, but but the hearings are effective because there are Republicans who are scratching their heads on this nuclear deterrence issue and wondering about it, and they need to hear other voices. Uh, the other thing is, I, you know, I, looking back on Obama, I mean, there's a, you know, there's a lot to regret about Obama, and this nuclear posture review is, is one of the things we can get. And he did, you're right, he did trade, um, you know, upgrades and modernization in exchange for the START Treaty. And it's possible that Biden will be doing the same when he talks to Putin. Uh, I mean, we, you know, Biden has a history here. When he talks to Putin, whenever it's gonna be next month, you know, he's gonna to be tough, American elections and Ukraine. And, uh, but sooner or later, they're gonna, they're gonna walk around the barn and get to strategic arm reductions. They're going to, because it's in Biden's heart. Now I know it's in Jake Sullivan's heart. I know it's in Tony Blinken's heart. They're gonna to get to it. Uh, and if they start cutting strategic warheads, not just warheads, but delivery systems, then the Minuteman three is going out the door. And Biden, uh, if he does that, and I, there is some chance that he will, certainly I'm not a mind reader, 
he's going to need support in the progressive left, stand up and cheer. Uh, getting rid of these, you know, whatever they are, 480 missiles in the middle of the country because they're there to be attacked. Um, that, I mean, that's, that would be a huge victory for us. And, and, I, and I think it's, I, you know, of all the things in the defense budget, that's the thing I look at that is very doable for us. Thank you. I appreciate your perspective. Uh, somebody raised in the chat the question about China and where do you think this is all going? Earlier, we gave an update on the Senate passing 68 to 32, the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act of 2021, which is a recipe for war, as far as I'm concerned, uh, with China. Of course, we don't want that and we need to push back, but it uh, looks like this is heading to the House and there's lots of bipartisan support. Your thoughts on China, U.S.-China relations? Well, it's, um, it's, it's a disappointment. Uh, my wife will tell you that what I'm doing now is uh, spraying the garbage with Lysol. Um, but I'm going to do it anyway. I, I don't think Biden wants a confrontation with China. I really don't. Um, but these are easy votes to get in the House and Senate. And, uh, you know, he can, he can walk down the street. Nobody says there, that guy is weak on China. So he's doing the typical kind of tri triangulation that sickened me by the Clinton administration. That, you know, he protects his, he protects his right and he uh, harvests the votes of conservative Democrats by banging the table on China. So now the Lysol is dissipated. And here's the here's how the garbage smells. This is really dangerous. Um, the Pentagon calls China a pacing threat. That means that China is matching our defense budget increases, uh, but their defense budget is a quarter of ours. Their technical know-how, their fighter aircraft, their fighter bombers don't match ours. <clears throat> they have one aircraft carrier, it's lousy. Um, they certainly don't have the heritage we do of interfering in foreign countries by dropping their military in the middle of it. Uh, but never mind, they're a pacing threat. But what that means in reality is they're not a peer competitor, which is the military's term for somebody to be afraid of. Uh, the United States military is not afraid of China. They're using China as a way to build their budget. Uh, it's a dangerous thing to do. I would like to say we're not headed to war, but history shows us that increased defense budgets often lead to, often lead military officers to the belief that they need to use what they build. And that's the danger here. Uh, I don't think that China's a peer competitor. Uh, they're certainly not a military peer competitor. I mean, we wanted them to be a, a market competitor. And now that they are a market competitor and have opened up their economy, we're complaining about it. Uh, and we shouldn't be. Mark, I, I've thought that we need to engage in outreach directly with the military on this, uh, to the rank and file military to say, uh, we are sending you a letter and we do not want you to attack China. Because I feel as though we have mad men and women running our government when it comes to building up, weaponizing the Indo-Pacific, the South China Sea area. I'd like to ask you about uh, three or four uh, representatives and, and get your take. Um, Adam Smith. So he's chair of the House Armed Services Committee from Washington. He's a hawk, uh, although he is co-sponsoring this no first strike bill. He is facing a primary challenge from a teacher who has the backing, I believe, of the National Education Association, a large organization, Cynthia Gallardo. Uh, I read uh, something that Adam Smith had, had written recently in which he was defending, vigorously defending the I don't call it the defense budget, the military budget, uh, and the U.S. Space Force saying, absolutely, we have to have both of these, that, that Biden has supported trillions of dollars for relief 
for those suffering from COVID and the economy slowdown and by all means we need this for our military, you know, just adamant about that. So uh, your take on Adam Smith, he also takes hundreds of thousands of dollars from military contractors, no shame there. So he's one. I'd also like your take on Senator Dianne Feinstein vis-a-vis the nuclear issue. We were out there, Code Pink recently, we hold held a rally, a, not, a, not a protest, a rally in front of her office, uh, met with her, one of her representatives in DC who happens to be a quote defense fellow. I never knew there was such a thing where the Pentagon actually pays the salary of yeah. defense fellows that are embedded in the offices of senators, outrageous. Uh, we met with her uh, urging Senator Feinstein who is the chair of the House of, of the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee over Energy, the Department of Energy, which would be overseeing the development of the, of the ground-based strategic deterrent to say, hey, speak out, oppose this, because I believe in 2014, she wrote an editorial for the Washington Post, an op-ed saying that our nuclear weapons program is unnecessary and unsustainable. So Dianne Feinstein, bring back that, that Dianne Feinstein. And the last person I wanna ask you about, so it's Adam Smith, Dianne Feinstein, and lastly, Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont. Now, he talks a good game often, yeah. And uh, wasn't he involved in pushing for the, the ban on landmines? Yeah, mm -hmm. credit for that. But he also uh, escorted the F-35 into Burlington. I know Bernie supported it as well, but uh, from those I've spoken to in Vermont, they really do blame Leahy for bringing the F-35 to the middle of Burlington, Vermont, at the airport there. Uh, he is chair of the, House, of the Senate Appropriations Committee. So, I would think that he would have a very powerful role to play in the military budget. Your take on those three. Gee, I wish this was off the record, but there are so <laughs> many people here. Um, Adam Smith is probably the best. I understand the problem with Adam Smith, but Adam Smith is probably the best military thinker on the Hill. He really knows what he's doing. He does. And he has come out with statements over the last three or four months. This is the Lysol spray again. He has come out with statements over the last three or four months talking about how the United States should not be seeking military hegemony or dominance in the Pacific, but parity, which is a lot different than what his colleagues are saying. I understand his voting record. I know where he is on military spending but he's the one guy who understands these military systems and understands military strategy and talk to the military far better than anyone on the Hill, in my opinion. He's gettable, he's gettable. Before you go on to the others, has he come out against the ground-based strategic deterrent? No, he has not, and he's not likely to, but he's gettable. Uh, I'm not an expert on the Hill, so I'll leave uh, Cynthia to you guys. Cynthia Gallardo, the primary challenge. Yeah, I, I know her record, I'm not impressed. Um, she says she's anti-imperialist, I like that. Well, yeah, um, I like that too, but I, you know, let's see where the votes go. Uh, I am not a big fan of the Senator from California. And I think it's past time for her to retire. And she's, I have seen over the years that she is easily swayed by conservative voices. One of the great secrets of the mid nineties was that Dianne Feinstein listened to Trent Lott a lot, which I found embarrassing for her. Uh, I, just, I just don't have much of a brief for her. Uh, Patrick Leahy, uh, I know personally, and I, I have admiration for him. I hear he's going to run for another term in the Senate. He just, he loves his, he loves his job. Uh, he's gettable. He doesn't really understand the military that well. It's not his thing. He's a judiciary guy. He's a court system guy, at which he's very, very good. Uh, but I, his, his aides and his staff are first rate on military issues. And they guide him. And, and he's very good. 
Mark, one last question. It's almost time for our capital calling party. I ask everybody to stay. We'll be calling about Palestine and China today. Uh, Mark, here's the question. Can you talk about the disastrous plans for plutonium pits and how <laughs> this impacts WIPP? Uh, can this be a good bipartisan campaign? Also, can you touch on the proposed Holtec nuclear waste facility? I can't, you know, honestly, I can't speak on any of those issues. I'm just not that familiar uh, with them. Um, and I'll leave that to, to your experts. But I wish you'd ask me the question they asked Kelly about the Israel-Palestine issue. Okay, I'm asking. Uh, because I worked in the West Bank, Gaza, and Israel for 20 years. Wow. And um, what were you doing there? I was helping Fatah, um, the mainline Palestinian organization, do politics, uh, not for pay. I lived in the Palestinian territories, I ended up really having a love affair with the Palestinian people, broken as they are, and for good reason. But I, I think that the, the recent conflict that we've seen there is different and profoundly so, primarily because we now have an uprising, which is continuing, but not in the pages of the paper, but is continuing inside of Israel itself, where Arab Israelis are now in the streets and being rounded up in massive numbers, 1,700 in jail in Israel. And this is new. It's, this, is, this is Black Lives Matter comes to Israel. And it's about time. So this is a very sensitive issue that we can make progress on. There's real discomfort in the halls of Congress with what Israel is doing. Of course, you get the standard. Israel has the right to defend itself. will defend Israel no matter what. You get Americans who are more Israeli than the Israelis. But uh, if you are around and as, as old as I am on this issue, in the 80s and 90s, you couldn't mention the Palestinians in Washington, D.C. or in the national media without being criticized as some kind of anti-Semite or being anti-Israel. That has changed, and that's significant. And I hope that we can continue to press on that issue. Well, thank you so much, Mark Perry, for joining us. Thank you all. Mark is a senior policy analyst for the Quincy Institute, writes for Responsible Statecraft, prolific author, and we are so grateful for your presence here tonight and have given us a lot to think about. Thank you. Thank Mark. you. Thank and, you very much. And Mark, before you go, I'd like to ask for our audience members before we go into our Capitol Hill uh, calling party, please unmute yourselves, uh, send your love to Mark and uh, let him know that we appreciate his presence here. And thank you for the time that you've spent educating us on this call. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys. And let's say happy birthday. Let's say happy birthday to Kelly. She was with us earlier. Can we say happy birthday? Happy birthday, Kelly. 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 Thank you. 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 Well, yeah. Yeah. So if I can have you all, please mute yourselves again. This is uh, where the action begins, and we're um, very honored to have how many people now on the call? We have about 105, so let's all stay. These calls make a huge difference. Uh, so what we're going to do today.